Hello, my name is James Hunter and this is my Two Cents channel where I talk about topics from my physical fitness, mental health, wellness, and just topics I may want to discuss. And today I'm going to talk about uh, individuals who uh, suffer from drug addiction, more specifically what is referred to as having an opioid use disorder. Uh, you know, just common terms, you know, people refer to individuals uh, as drug addicts, uh, heroin addicts, just to use some uh, street language, uh, not to offend anybody. Uh, but the individuals who uh, essentially have suffered from addiction, they've been in and out of treatment, and some may, uh, you know, have tried more than once, some have been in a, and failed with traditional treatment. So I have worked in a methadone clinic myself. It's more commonly referred to as medication assistance treatment. And there's a lot of, there's more than uh, one medication than just methadone, but I'm going to talk about uh, methadone a lot in this video, I guess, the medication. Uh, that I've seen used uh, a lot with heroin addicts or people with opioid use disorder. And I want to talk about um, some of the uh, stigma, some of the myths and misunderstandings because I just think it's important to uh, advocate for people that are in recovery because unfortunately uh, there can be a bit of, um, you know, uh, negative stigma stereotypes uh, just due to, and prejudice if you will, due to uh, just uh, misunderstandings. And not, I guess maybe not having the information, or you could just call it, uh, if you want to use the word bigotry, if you will. And that has to do with kind of like an old school of thought uh, versus, you know, more uh, contemporary modern ways of uh, treating people. Now, traditionally, you know, you have an old school of people like with uh, NA, Narcotics Anonymous, and 12 Steps, who are from an, uh, an older school that they believe in 100% total abstinence from any and all drugs. And that unless you are completely abstinent uh, from everything, you are not clean and you are not sober. So in other words, if you're someone who is um, taking methadone, a prescribed methadone, a medically supervised, and you're not using other illicit drugs, but if you're still using methadone, for certain individuals, in their mind, they don't believe you're clean and sober. And we're going to talk about that. Now, I'm not saying that um, all old timer uh, people in recovery that have you know been clean and sober 30 plus uh, or 40 years are all uh, of that mindset because they're not there's a lot that have adjusted with the times uh, particularly to those who may be working in the treatment industry but myself I'm a an LPC in Texas licensed professional counselor and I also am an LCDC uh, licensed chemical dependency counselor I have both of those licenses, and I will tell you that uh, sometimes I have been um, surprised um, uh, by the closed-mindedness of individuals who are counselors themselves. Uh, I one time had a, a conversation with an individual. This uh, gentleman was uh, in his 60s. And this person was very against uh, methadone uh, treatment or medication assistance treatment. Had a very biased uh, view against it and just, uh, you know, didn't view people who are on methadone as being a basically in recovery. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic uh, criteria in the DSM-5, a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of uh, Mental Disorders, 5th edition, the uh, American Psychiatric Association. They're, you know, the authority, uh, if you will. Uh, this manual is used essentially, uh, you know, you get your criteria uh, as far as in diagnosing uh, mental health and substance use disorders. And I'm going to talk about this because, you know, recovery and, and, and as far as what constitutes having a substance use disorder or viewing uh, that, that profile of what it is to, to be a drug, drug addict and, and recovery and so on. So according to the DSM-5, I could read it verbatim, but I can just tell you by memory, is that substance use disorders are a cluster of cognitive uh, behavioral and physiological symptoms okay so it's not just um, as simple as other uh, type of situations you know when you use the disease model you know if someone has uh, cancer for example the the doctor at MD Anderson or whatever a uh, treatment facility that uh, treats cancer they typically don't tell a cancer patient that I strongly recommend you you work a 12-step program you know and 12-step program has that fourth step where you make a fearless uh, moral inventory uh, and you also look to uh, uh, have God uh, remove these uh, character defects, uh, the God of your understanding, your higher power, however that uh, works for you. And you essentially deal with uh, 
character defects and correcting that and so on and making amends and and I could uh, pull up the 12 steps and go over that and um, actually I have a separate video where I where I do that so in the DSM-5 when you get right to it uh, what substance use disorders are the first thing it says is that the essential feature meaning that it's required for substance use disorder is that cluster okay not just one uh, independent of each other but all of them a cluster of cognitive behavioral and physiological symptoms indicating that the individual continues using the substance despite significant substance related problems now it's very important i want you to listen to that substance related problems and that's very key so you know you can have an individual who becomes abstinent from drugs and as an AA with Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, they talk about dry drunks. Well, a dry drunk essentially could be someone who discontinued using uh, alcohol, but they still have the same behavioral uh, and cognitive type of problems, distortions, uh, thinking errors, uh, character defects, if you want to use that word. So despite the abstinence of alcohol or a drug, a person can still have the cognitive and uh, behavioral problems that disrupt that continue to disrupt their life in regards to job, uh, relationships, uh, and so on. Their life, you know, still to some extent may be somewhat uh, unmanageable. So when we talk about people that come into for medication assistance treatment, what you got to understand is that the statistics will show you that uh, detox alone for a lot of individuals who have an opioid use disorder or substance use disorder, uh, that detox alone by itself, if that's the only thing a person does, 90%, as much as 90% within three months are going to relapse again if you do not address, you know, the, the con cognitive and behavioral aspects uh, and those type of therapies to help the individual have a program of recovery to develop new coping mechanisms, uh, alternative ways of managing stress, uh, creating a different life, if you will, to replace the old one. To make it easier to have a strategy to not use drugs to not relapse uh, managing what are referred to as uh, triggers that if you will internal and external and so on and that, that'll be a different video so i want to keep it um on point for the the topic of this video and i'll be having a series about uh, mat treatment so let's get to my my uh, next part of this let's talk about the um diagnostic criteria and what you will find is that there's 11 there's 11 um of these in here now you have mild uh, mild moderate to severe in regards of uh, these diagnoses now whether it's opioid use disorder stimulant use disorder whether someone's using methamphetamines cocaine cannabis um, alcohol you're gonna see these 11 criteria in here so I'm going somewhere with this and this is uh, let me read these out so when I worked in a methadone clinic, and I've worked in other settings, a supported residential inpatient uh, short term, uh, I've worked in some more long term uh, inpatient settings for residential treatment, some outpatient programs, private practice, and I've worked for um, some state entities and uh, other capacities as a counselor uh, working uh, for the purpose of rehabilitation of people with uh, substance use disorders and also sometimes co occurring mental health uh, situations going on as well. So let's look at this right here and then we're going to decide together in this video whether or not we we have an agreement or what do you, what do you think does a person who is a person who's in a, a program of recovery who is on a ther a stable dose of methadone who no longer uses any illicit drugs that means they only take what's prescribed and supervised by a doctor and they've stabilized their life and they got their life back in order again I'm going to talk more about that as far as the stabilization of, the, of their life. If their only thing they're taking is methadone, and yes, it's still an opioid, and it's a, it's a longer-acting opioid. They only have to dose uh, once every 24 hours. That's why it's effective. Uh, if that's the only thing they're taking, are they clean and sober? If you want to use that word uh, clean figuratively or you know, however you want to uh, think of being clean, not literally taking a bath, but clean in terms of sobriety, right? And they're abstinent for everything else. Are they, do you count that as sobriety? If they're in a 12-step meeting and they're sitting across from you and, and they say they're on methadone, and maybe you're not on methadone, maybe you're on a, a, antidepressant, or maybe you're not on anything. You're just totally abstinent, just your coffee, right? Caffeine, which technically is a drug. Uh, but 
you know, anything can technically be abused. But do these individuals who are in a medication assistance treatment program on methadone, do you consider them as uh, clean and sober? Or are they just trading one drug for another? And I'm going to talk about that because uh, there's a big misunderstanding on that. So let's get into what constitutes someone having an opioid use disorder or a substance use disorder, or if you want to just use slang terms, uh, drug addict, you know, heroin addict, however that works for you. Uh, I'm not being too PC in this video. So criteria number one, opioids or, the or a drug are often taken in larger amounts or over a longer period than was intended. Number two, there is a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control opioid or, or drug use. Three, a great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain the opioid or drug use. Um, and use of the opioids or drugs or recover from its effects. So you spend a great deal of time either uh, using, recovering, or a great amount of time in activities necessary to obtain uh, the drug. You know, a lot of people might unfortunately uh, do e commit illegal activities and so on to get money to purchase uh, drugs from a drug dealer and so on. You get the idea on that one. Number four, cravings or a strong desire or urge to use opioids or a drug. Five, reoccurrent opioid use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home or any other drug. Like I said, it could be cocaine, meth, whatever. But we're talking about people um, on methadone, so I'm reading from the opioid use disorder. And this criteria is going to be the same pretty much for all drugs, uh, substance use disorders. Number seven, important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up uh, or reduced because of opioid use. Um, I think I skipped number six. Let me read that one. Continued opioid use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused by or exacerbated by the effects of opioids. Uh, let's go to eight. Recurrent opioid use in situations in which it's physically hazardous. Um, nine. Continued opioid use despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated by the substance. 10. Tolerance as defined by either of the following. A need for markedly increased amounts of opioids to achieve intoxication or desired effect. B. A markedly, markedly diminished effect with continued use of the same amount of an opioid. Note that the criterion, this criterion is not considered to be met for those taking opioids solely under appropriate medical supervision. So just um, tolerance and some withdrawal, if that's the only thing a person has by itself without all this other stuff going on, that doesn't constitute a substance uh, use disorder. A lot of people go in for uh, uh, surgery and so on, and yeah, their body will develop a physical tolerance and they'll have some withdrawal. They have a temporary period of uh, physical dependence, but if that's the only thing going on and then they move about, about their life and go forward, uh, that by itself does not uh, make them a, have a substance use disorder. That's important to remember. All right, 11, with, withdrawal as manifested by either of the following. The characteristic opioid withdrawal syndrome uh, referred to criterion A and B of criteria set for opioid withdrawal. That's a, another part of the book. Uh, B, opioids or a closely related substance are taken to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. Sometimes people who are uh, addicted to heroin and uh, opiates or opioids, um, if they can't get access to those, then they will. They might take benzodiazepines, uh, use some other illicit substance. Um, I know some will even go drink, and that's not even really their thing. They'll drink alcohol. Something, they try to mitigate or, or reduce the, uh, the uncomfortable feeling they have of withdrawal. So those are 11 that I just mentioned. I'm going to go ahead and leave the, this open because I'm going to come back to it. So these, this 11 criteria, you're going to pretty much uh, see that whether it's for methamphetamines, cocaine, and so on and so on. So the continued use despite negative effects. Number nine, again, continued use despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated by the substance. So let me tell you, when patients or individuals come into a methadone clinic, in the very beginning, you know, most individuals have an opioid use disorder that's severe uh, in terms of the, at least six of these criteria. So 
if they have six or more of these symptoms or of this criteria, that's an opioid use disorder, a, a severe one. And most of the individuals that I worked with, you know, if they're coming to a methadone clinic, it's they're desperate for help. You know, they're suffering. They're tired of having to use heroin every four, five hours, six hours, whatever that situation is. It's that compulsiveness to use and keep fixing and using so they don't have a diarrhea, vomiting, bone aches, the chills, and so on. You know, a lot. It's a very un uncomfortable, uh, acute withdrawals they can go through, and. There's a lot that could be said that's going on with the brain and, and how all that works as far as um, this uh, opioid use disorder. It's not always, um, you know, yes, there are individuals who had to kick uh, in jail, for example, or some have uh, came off, uh, kicked it cold turkey, if you want to use that term, and became abstinence and got into recovery. Some people were able to do that, but not everyone is in a situation uh, to be able to, to do it that way and then uh, not relapse and and then get into a program of recovery. Uh, if that was the case, then you wouldn't, uh, you know, a lot, everybody would be clean, clean and sober. But what you have are individuals who failed when they try to do that. So they're coming to a methadone clinic because everything else has failed. So when they come in, you're going to see a lot of this stuff. You're going to see number nine. When I talk to these individuals, uh, they have they have failure to stop using. They continue to use despite having a persistent uh, recurrent physical and uh, psychological problems. You'll see them with abscess from injecting, uh, infections. Uh, some will have uh, hepatitis C sometimes, um, deterioration of their physical health. And it's not an issue of uh, reason and logic. Logically, they can reason that what's going on is not a good thing. They get it. It's not an education problem. You know, if education was uh, the solution, you just provide the education, people stop using drugs. So the problem is, is that the compulsion to use the drug because of what's going on in the brain at the time is that willpower and their reason alone is not sufficient to stop going and using drugs. That's the insanity of their addiction. They understand that it doesn't make sense that they did not, you know, Put their family first that their job wasn't important enough for them to stop using they understand that it makes no sense to continue shooting up with heroin uh, when they know that they could die so it's not an issue of, of their the reason and logic objectively if you have a conversation they understand that so it's not that simple so when they come in they're going to have that criteria met they're going to have a lot of times a legal complex uh, with the law sometimes you're going to see an uh, inability to keep a job. So these 11 criteria that I met, they have that when they come in. So yeah, they have the opioid use disorder. What I consider them at that point in time as somebody who's uh, in recovery? No, they're not in recovery. Their life is unstable. But I'll tell you this, as far as from experience, when these individuals come in here, they will start to become uh, physically healthier, their mental health improves. They get on a stable dose of methadone, which holds, I believe, up to six times longer than the faster acting opioids like her opiates like heroin or opioids like uh, hydrocodones, uh, the faster acting ones that don't hold as long. Uh, with meth methadone, you know, a, th a stable therapeutic dose based on just experience with the patients will hold them as long as 36 hours uh, before they start experiencing withdrawal. So they only dose every 24 hours. Due to that, they're able to be stable and focus on other things um, instead of trying to use every, you know, four or five hours or however that was working for them with their situation. And then they're just out, you know, not able to keep a job, not able to focus on anything other than supporting that, uh, that drug addiction. So with the methadone on the stable dose, I've seen patients, if they lived out, lived out of town, and they, and they missed the dose because their car broke down or whatever, when they came in on the next day, um, I would ask them, did you have to use uh, any illicit drugs or did you feel compelled to use? Did you use heroin, any illicit opioids? And they would say, no, you know, I started to feel, you know, somewhat of the withdrawal coming on, but they were able to hang on until they got in that next day. So in some cases with some of the patients, you know, they, they were able to get up to 48 hours um, on just that, on their last dose of methadone. So 
with the methadone, yes, it's an opioid, so they'll still have a, a tolerance. And if they were to stop, yes, they're going to have a withdrawal. And it'll actually be more protracted and drawn out because it's a longer acting opioid. So they're still going to have that aspect of it. But what you're going to see disappear, uh, as far as the criteria, I've seen people that were homeless on the street. Uh, and we take their pictures. We would take their pictures when they would come in as a new patient. And for lack of a better word, they look all torn up looking. You ever seen that picture of Nick Nolte, his arrest picture in jail, and he just, the guy looks hammered, right? You're like, oh my God, it's like a zombie or something. Uh, and not, I'm not trying to make fun of it, but it's just, you know, these individuals, they look horrible. Their health is just so deteriorated. They look older than their, their stated age. And so what you'll see in three months, six months time, a year's time, we update the photo in, in the computer because it's there on, on file on their computer file, uh, the software program, because the nurse needs to see their picture come up when they dose them, and then they have to have their ID to make sure it's the individual. So when you compare the photo of them when they became a patient, they look all torn up looking, and then you see them six months later, it's like a it's like a it's a new it's a different person. It's night and day. I mean, it's like wow, they look younger. Their their physical health becomes restored. Uh, their mental health obviously is benefiting and what you'll see instead of having to uh, spend hundreds of dollars a day uh, to, to buy heroin uh, illicit drugs and usually do things that are harmful to themselves some cases prostitution uh, stealing uh, rescue behaviors to obtain money illicitly to support that habit what you'll see are people are not having to do that now because they're they're not having withdrawal anymore. They're on a stable dose of that methadone, which is a long-acting opioid. So now they can focus on, hey, I can get a job, right? You'll see them reconcile with family members. Uh, relationships start to improve. Uh, they'll get off the street. They'll get an apartment. Um, I've seen uh, couples that were in recovery together uh, just totally put their lives uh, back on point, they had good jobs, they were paying bills, saving money, started taking vacations, having a quality of life. And this criteria that I mentioned, um, all this stuff disappeared because they're, yes, they're on, they're using a drug, which is an opioid, but now you have the opposite. You don't have a situation where there's continued use of a substance despite uh, deterioration of their physical health or uh, damage to their physical health or mental health. What you have now is the opposite. You have physical health and mental health improving and getting better while on a prescribed drug. That is a different situation than criteria number, the ninth one I mentioned, where it says continued opioid use despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical and psychological harm, right? So individuals are no longer injecting themselves for those who use uh, IV drug use uh, and so on. So you're going to see that disappear. Uh, number seven, important social, occupational, or recreational activities being given up or reduced because of the substance use, the opioid use. So number seven, that disappears when an individual is using methadone as a tool for recovery. Uh, I've known plenty of patients. You'll see them now, their social uh, activities increase Part of that might be going to a support group meetings, uh, going to their children's birthdays. Maybe they might get involved uh, with something uh, within their culture, like going to church. Uh, they, I mentioned they have a job again. Uh, recreational activities, they take up uh, interests and hobbies they used to have, that, but now they can pursue them again. So these things, you see the opposite happen. Those start to increase, not decrease. You have the use of a prescribed drug an opioid but now you have an opposite effect or outcome right you don't have the the decline you have the increase and improvement in the quality of life um let me see okay D uh, a persistent persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control opioid use so when they came in to become a patient uh, in a methadone clinic a map program yeah, they had that in the beginning. They obviously were unsuccessful. They, they were powerless to stop on their own. Um, or, you know, if they could, they wouldn't be presenting for treatment and help. So now they're being medically supervised and they have achieved the controlled use of a medication that's uh, observed doses based on a, a take-home schedule that they're on based on uh, the privileges they earn uh, based on time and treatment. 
So you see that occur. So number two is not there no more. They don't meet that anymore because now they have controlled use of, of medically supervised medication. The first criteria, opioids are often taken in larger amounts. Well, that's not happening if they're on a stable therapeutic dose of methadone. And they're, um, so that, that one's gone. They don't meet that criteria no more. Uh, they're, on, they're on a stable dose of methadone. They're no longer spending a great deal of time uh, in activities necessary to obtain illicit heroin or opioids. So they're not, you know, spending a lot of their time and energy to try to find out how they're going to buy, you know, uh, $80 uh, for uh, $20 papers or, or five $20 papers worth of heroin, right? Uh, that's not happening no more. So now uh, they're not spending time having to recover from, uh, you know, you, uh, using too much drugs or from uh, its, its effects. That's not happening. Because when they're on a stable dose of methadone, they can function and do, do their job and go about their daily business just like everyone else. All right. So that's not being met anymore once they're on a therapeutic and stable dose of methadone. So you can look at, in a DSM-5, at this criteria here. So you'll see that their life improves. They get stable. Once they've been in medication assistance treatment program long enough, and you see that improvement, you can see the difference in the pictures that, that are taken. It's just, it's a tremendous, it's a different person. I can just tell you, it's amazing. So the only thing that really will remain is that that number um, 11, the 10, okay, the tolerance and that withdrawal aspect, you know, they get titrated to a, a therapeutic dose of methadone that's gonna be appropriate to them. And there's a titration phase and you just, they want to get on a dose that's good enough to hold them a 24-hour period between dose and periods uh, so they don't feel compelled to have to just, you know, be drug-seeking. Now, as far as uh, each individual, it's not going to be the same for everyone. And that withdrawal aspect, you know, I've worked with individuals um, who have uh, actually have, you know, they, they use the term they kicked it, right? They came off of uh, heroin or hydrocodone, Vicodin, Oxycontin. Um, methadone, right? They had to come off of those. Some got went to jail and they didn't have no, uh, you know, medically supervised detox. They just had to kick it, you know, the hard way. So what they will tell you from experience is that coming off methadone, the the withdrawal is protracted and more drawn out. It, it's it's different or a bit harder, if you will. Some say it's it's harder because it's the longer acting opioid. It's gonna it's gonna be longer coming off it. Just this kind of goes together with that situation. So those who are in a medication assistance treatment programs, they can taper off of it and do it gradually. And I've seen them achieve that too. So back to my original point. Remember uh, when I asked the question, if somebody is on methadone, does that count as being clean and sober? Well, if they don't meet the criteria anymore to have a substance use disorder in the DSM-5, because they've eliminated the behaviors associated with that criteria. And all they have is that is the withdrawal aspects you're going to experience when they come off of methadone. Now you're dealing with a medical issue of them eventually being able to transition, if that becomes appropriate for them, to completely transition to taper off the, the methadone altogether, and then to be able to use different uh, coping net mechanisms a uh, different way of living, managing stress, um, program recovery, if you will, to make it easier to, to, well, to not relapse and go back to using uh, opiates or any other drugs for that matter. So if the only criteria they have is that, that in and of itself doesn't, doesn't make somebody a drug addict or an opioid use disorder. You know, phys physiological symptom you're dealing with that. So if the only issue issue you have after one, two years in medication assistance treatment on methadone, and you go to the 11 criteria for a substance use disorder, in my opinion, you know, people may disagree, but in my opinion, if all you have is the physiological symptom of that withdrawal aspect, and maybe a tolerance withdrawal with the methadone, then that by itself does not complete, remember the definition the essential feature of a substance use disorder is, a, is that cluster, right? What's a cluster? It's, it's more than one thing. A cluster of cognitive, behavioral, and, 
and physiological symptoms, okay, including the continued use of a substance. So a person on methadone, if they're working a program of recovery, and let's say they're doing a 12-step program, and they've uh, worked the fourth, well, all the steps really, but really the, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and they're, they did a fearless uh, moral inventory, and they um, identified patterns of character defects, and they uh, humbly asked their higher power or whatever that situation is for them to help to remove those defects of character. And then they made uh, amends uh, where it was possible to do so and so on. And you saw a change in their way of thinking. You know, they eliminated thinking errors. They had a healthier view of the world and healthier coping mechanisms. So if you see individuals have a change cognitively, the changes behaviorally, and they no longer after six months, a year, two years, or however their time is in treatment, everyone is different. But if I go through this diagnostic criteria and I look at John Doe, and John Doe no longer uh, ha has a persistent desire or unsuccessful effort to cut down or control opioids, he doesn't have that no more because he, he is under control. He's being medically supervised. He's been on the same dose of methadone for, for the last year, and now he's thinking about tapering. So he's in a controlled situation, so he doesn't meet that no more. Uh, I look at John Doe. Well, you know what? John Doe is employed full-time now. He, he goes to his uh, son's baseball games. So he no longer is spending a great deal of time in, uh, in activities and trying to obtain drugs, the heroin, right? And he's no longer having to spend a lot of time recovering from its effects. So he no longer meets that. Why? Because he's on a stable dose of medication. Number four. He no longer has cravings anymore. Why? Because methadone, it, it occupies the opioid receptor sites and uh, prevents withdrawal. So he's, he doesn't have that situation anymore. He doesn't have a strong desire or urge to go seek out and use illicit drugs. So he doesn't meet that no more. Number five, uh, a recurrent uh, failure result or current um, use resulted in failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, and home. Well, again, if John Doe has been working, he's uh, re he's reconciled his relationships. He spends time with his son, and he's engaged in all that. He does not meet that criteria no more, and so on and so on. I can go down this whole list. So they are, are working a program of recovery. Uh, they're and number six, the continued use, despite, uh, yeah, I mentioned that one. And really, I want to hit on the, they're all important. But the feature I see that's really sad is that continued use of a substance or drug, despite the deterioration of physical health and mental health, and they know it's, it's causing it, but they, they continue to use despite that. So they, John, I'm using the John Doe name as just a, an example person, but so if John Doe, no longer has that, you know, their physical health has improved. I gave the example of the pictures that were taken of before and afters, and their mental health has improved. They've developed uh, healthy coping skills and so on. Well, now you have a situation where they're on a uh, medically supervised drug, an opioid, a medication, but now you have the opposite effect. You, you have improvement of physical health, improvement of mental health, and stabilizing of their life while continuing to be on a medication. It's a different situation. So I think you get the, the, the point that I'm making here is that I think that, you know, there's a, a rush to judgment as far as um, what constitutes recovery. Uh, there's more than one way. And there's, there's more than uh, one type of program of recovery. Uh, <clears throat> you can talk about, you know, individuals and what type of drugs they may have uh, abused or had a, a substance use disorder with. You know, some people have, may have only done alcohol, some people may have only done stimulants, some people are only the opioids, and some people, you know, it's more than one, or it's, it's a combination of, you know, methamphetamine and heroin and different profile and pictures uh, for a lot of people. So what people deal with in terms of um, post-acute withdrawal syndrome, in terms of the body getting balanced and back and stable again, it may not always be exactly the same for everybody. So because of that, sometimes there may be a lack of uh, understanding or empathy for someone's recovery because maybe you haven't uh, had to deal with um, 
they're, they're, the type of situation they're dealing with in terms of their transition of getting their sleep back to normal, their mood, their energy, and so on. Uh, I, I know a guy that he was on 160 milligrams of uh, methadone for 10 years, uh, medically supervised, and then he finally got off it, um, and he went through about six months of, you know, just that post-acute withdrawal syndrome, and now he's he's not on anything anymore. He's, uh, he's a counselor, but, and that was his situation, and so it's, everybody's different in terms of um, their journey and, and how they're going to get to where they're going to be. I think the larger picture is is people becoming stable, uh, harm reduction, and what's best for society, what's, what's better for the world. So if someone is no longer harming themselves, they're no longer, uh, and let's be honest, substance use disorders and drug addiction, it's not just harming them, it can harm the people around them and harm society. So rather than splitting hairs and deciding on who's clean and sober and what that means, you know, look at the big picture. If a person doesn't have a, if you want to use the word character defects uh, that were a part of their substance use and drug use, if they've corrected that, if their life has become stable and their health is improving, and the only thing they still, they're just down to the physiological aspect that yes, they're going to have a somewhat of a, they're going to have that physical, physiological um, connection with the methadone of uh, withdrawal and, and that physical dependence. And that's perhaps for them might be their last hurdle that they're dealing with before they, if they eventually taper off. If that's the only thing they have, then in, in my humble opinion, uh, that person not only is in recovery, but they don't have that criteria anymore that warrants a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. I mean, you can use the word remission, uh, stable, uh, you know, and so on, sustained remission, and that's in the DSM-5 too, and so on. So it's really, that's what you got to look at, you know, before we start uh, judging other people and be thankful for them. If somebody's at, at a 12-step meeting sitting across from you and and somebody tells you, oh, I saw Jane Doe and she was at that methadone clinic. You know what? You know, be thankful that she's there at a 12-step meeting and that, you know, she's uh, doing something medically supervised. And if that's the only thing that that person is doing, you know, good for them. And if they got a job and, and they're becoming productive in their life and society, you know, focus on that. You know, because uh, everything else in due time, you know, may take care of itself uh, when it's meant to be. There's more than one way um, for recovery. And, you know, is an old saying that I like to use is that 5 plus 5 equals 10, but so does 7 plus 3, right? There's more than one way to get the same outcome. So what are your thoughts uh, about my video today about uh, our people who are on methadone, buprenorphine, which is like Suboxone, uh, and other uh, medication assistance uh, type treatment for opioid use disorder? Are, are they in a program of recovery? Uh, does their, do they have clean time? Are they sober in your opinion, right? Based on uh, the context that I just laid out there. Uh, drop your comments below. I'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, there's a lot more that can be said. I, I, I worked in a methadone clinic, as I mentioned, as a counselor, and there's things that can be talked about in terms of, uh, you know, the harm, the harm reduction aspect of it. Uh, those who use methadone and MAP, type treatment, they can, who use it as a tool, uh, it works. And the reality is, yeah, there are people who do, uh, will abuse it if they're not ready to change yet, and they may continue using other type of illicit substances. And when that occurs, you're gonna see that they still meet that criteria that I read, and that's the difference. They're, they're not really in recovery yet, and that does happen. But that doesn't mean uh, that it doesn't work for some people. And that's just gonna, that's the way it's gonna be in any treatment program, by the way. Uh, you're going to have people that are kind of just going through the motions, uh, that are not really committed, and you have those that are uh, ready to change, they're in a program of recovery, and they are using their tools. So if you liked the video, I'd appreciate it. Click like, and if you'd subscribe to my channel, I appreciate that too. I appreciate the support. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I make videos on mental health, physical fitness, wellness, and just topics I may want to discuss like the one today. So until I make another video, I hope you have a good weekend and take care. Thank you.